this topic is obviously uh, touching a lot of people. For some people, it's sensitive. For some people, it's insightful. Whether it's insensitive or insightful, it's a reality that we have to uh, address, that we need to address. Um, and because you may be offended by it, the mere idea of talking about it doesn't make it irrelevant. It doesn't make it real for a lot of people. It's nothing to be offended about. You can always change the channel. No disrespect. I want to give a quick shout out though to uh, folks that responded and, and submitted some questions via the email. You can always email me at let's chew the gum at gmail.com. So I'll give a shout out to some listeners in Ireland, Mexico, United Kingdom, El Salvador, Germany, Canada, Argentina, Japan, France, Puerto Rico, Belgium, Switzerland, Singapore, Trinidad and Tobago, Cameroon, Russia, and the Czech Republic. Thank you for your questions. I'm going to address some of those on the show today. Welcome to Let's Chew the Gum Season 2, Episode 2. Welcome to Let's Chew the Gum. I'm your host, Protocol. We talk a lot about a lot of things in this show. While we chew the gum, and just like every show, we always have something for your mind. 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 Something for your mind. 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 Something for your mind. Something for your mind. Something for your, for your Let's get right into it. Uh, welcome to season two, episode two of Let's Chew the Gum, the podcast where we talk about everything from A to Z while we chew the gum. Always feel free to email in to the show at let's chew the gum at gmail.com if you have questions comments show topics or if you'd like to be a guest on the show you are obviously listening to this podcast but just want to let you know that you can find this podcast on multiple platforms including apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, uh, spotify breaker quite a few other ones i want to get right into this show um to uh, address some of the concerns or some of the questions that uh, listeners from around the world uh, have uh, asked. In the intro, I, I mentioned those countries and uh, I want to make sure that we understand uh, that also includes the uh, United States. We have some questions from, from the some listeners in the U.S. So what I did, I, I uh, reviewed the questions and sort of compiled them into a lot of them had overlapped. So um, let's just start there. So the first question comes from DL in uh, Trinidad and Tobago. And the question is, what do you mean? There was no need for white supremacy during slavery. Wasn't that white supremacy? DL, you are absolutely correct. Um, and what I was suggesting was that, uh, there was no need for racism during slavery uh, within those slave areas, um, obviously in, in other areas outside of the slave uh, holding states and uh, areas. And what I meant by that is when you are in control or when those uh, slaveholders were in control, that was it. The law was in their favor. Society's norms were in their favor. So there was no need to uh, have racism. Uh, racism is a, a component of a power structure. Um, ideas and, and policies are enacted uh, based upon race in order to keep um, a particular uh, group in power or to provide certain advantages to that particular group. Well, slavery was instituted. So so that's that's what I was uh, attempting to address there. I definitely 
appreciate that uh, that question to allow me to clarify. Um, you know, white supremacy, we can uh, trace back to uh, colonialism, I suppose, uh, um, during the Industrial Revolution, when uh, European powers were able to uh, amass large uh, amounts of uh, military force, which was based upon um, resources that they um, oftentimes had to go into other areas to acquire such as Africa and Southeast Asia. Uh, many of those resources were depleted in Europe. And, uh, you know, once they were able to create some advanced weapons, um, that allowed them to uh, oftentimes subdue their opponents. Um, and many times, let's not uh, mistake this, oftentimes it's just like today, political arrangements. It wasn't that... Uh, Europeans were so powerful that they could just go in and overpower African communities, for example. Um, they were well fortified and advanced militarily themselves, but a lot of uh, infighting between different communities and um, agreements between African leaders and European powers um, obviously led to slavery. But this idea that Europeans were a supreme being um, I would suggest has its foundations um, in that time frame. And, and, and mostly it's an ideology. It was never true. But, you know, when you control the press and the media and you're able to put that information out there and reinforce it over and over. Uh, for some people, it becomes a pseudo reality. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me go on to the next question. It says uh, this is from A.B. in Puerto Rico. What's up, A.B.? Um, it says, if white doesn't exist, then why do people identify as white, black, etc.? And that's in reference to a statement from the last episode where I said that the idea of white is a social construct. It doesn't exist. People didn't identify themselves as white people. Uh, and, and we're speaking, uh, I was speaking from the, the uh, perspective of U.S. history. Um, but I venture to say worldwide, people didn't consider themselves white. They considered themselves uh, from whatever nation they um, originated from. You know, they were Dutch or German or British, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, later on, um, even American. But this idea of, of whiteness, racial categories in general, were things that were created to stratify society. And um, I made the suggestion or pointed out, I should say, last week that um, the idea of white um, became synonymous with <clears throat> uh, political power, with, with property, with uh, advantages that were given to a particular group of people. And un unfortunately, you know, over time, people have bought into that. Um, so why do we still have uh, white? Uh, supremacy. I mean, when you, when you think about it, um, does that even make sense? If you are a white supremacist, that it, does, does <laughs> I'm getting my tongue tied here. Does that make sense that because of a particular color that you are superior or, or a certain hue or skin tone that you are superior to someone else? It doesn't make sense, but people are, are losing their minds um, over this because as it comes to an end and as it's gotten rid of as it should be, uh, people are scrambling uh, to figure out where they stand, you know, for most of their lives and uh, the lives of their recent ancestors. It's been something that they've been able to take advantage of um, most often illegally. It's, it's I mean, just because a, a laws were made, you know, we have Jim Crow laws and these types of laws that that uh, supported white supremacy. Those were unjust laws. Um, and and uh, that that time is is really past. Um, make it on your merit. You know, a lot of folks I, I have discussed this with, you know, oftentimes talked about as, uh, minorities, uh, what were considered minorities. There's another misnomer, uh, but they've talked about 
or address minorities to say, you know, uh, make it on your own merit, um, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, hard work, dedication, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the same applies. The same applies um, to those that would identify as white supremacists and those that are um, engaging in terrorist acts because they are fearing the loss of uh, political and economic advantages that were given to them or provided or allotted to them um, with really no merit at all. Let me, uh, I'm going to go on to this next question. Uh, this question is from a hist from history teacher. That's the way they phrase it. History teacher in Maryland. Um, the question is, why would the government want to keep people divided? Well, first of all, let me say that we are the government. You know, I always cringe a little bit when I hear people say the government doesn't, the government won't. We are the government. Um, the problem is that we've given up so much power to the government, you know, a little bit of unearned reverence for government officials. Um, the fact of the matter is, and this is one area where I can agree with many folks that stormed the Capitol. I don't agree with this idea at all. Don't get me. Don't get it wrong. But the idea that many folks were saying they work for us. That's true. The government works for us. We hired them in our representative democracy, in our republic. The way it works is they represent us, which means they're there to do our work. And when they don't do our work, it's our job to get them out. And in this country, we do that through the process of voting. Right. We don't do it through the process of overthrow, although that's a, that's a part of government. You know, when you see people rioting, it's just like any other uh, situation you you call a riot, whether it was in Detroit or Watts or Newark or anywhere else you've seen riots. Um, I don't immediately pass judgment on the rioters. I'm looking at the government because that's an indication that the government was not responsive to the needs of the people. Right. And in the case of now that there's some distinctions and someone can call in or email and, and help me to clarify this. The distinction that I see, you know, riots that were uh, based in Watts, L.A., <clears throat> Detroit, if you want to call those riots, um, those were situations where people were not listened to by their government for years and years. They struggled under the oppression of racism, discrimination and inequities. And, you know, people sought to you know, have some redress for those grievances constitutionally. And they went ignored. They went ignored. And, and you know, I always liken uh, riots to a baby, you know, when a baby want something and you're not giving the baby what it needs. You know, the baby doesn't have the words or the ability to express itself. So it cries or maybe even throws a tantrum and a riot is much like a cry out or a tantrum. These are populations that are, have been made to feel helpless and haven't been able to, again, have a resolution to their problems. The government didn't respond in the, in the case of the Capitol. Um, I don't know. Um, if that can go in the same category, I don't know if, if there was a government that wasn't responsive to the people. Or th do they say it wasn't responsive because they believed the election was uh, fraudulent? Um, I don't know. But why would a government want to keep people divided? I wouldn't say it's the government. Again, we're the government. But there are individuals um, for those that didn't catch episode one. Um, this question comes from a statement I made where. You know, in the past, blacks, whites and Native Americans, you know, if you want to call it brown people, red people, you know, you, you self identify. I, I never want to label anyone. But the fact of the matter is that all those groups were enslaved and they worked together. But there was always a a, a gentry, a landed class, like a property class of folks, a, an elite class, um, so to speak, that was behind um that type of a situation and they had a vested vested interest in keeping people divided because if those poor and enslaved black, white and brown people uh, would have uh, 
continue to amass uh, tight relationships, that's a power structure. So it was advantageous for the, for those folks to divide them. And it just so happens that a lot of those folks who had uh, who were the elites were the folks that were running the government and that continue to run the government. I mean, when you think about it, if you have a position you want to protect in a society of supposed laws, the best way to do that is to be the lawmaker. Right. So um, if I am a person with a vested interest to keep particular powers um, and I'm in government, I, I do have an interest in dividing the people. But again, that's not every person in the government. Right. Those are individuals. So if I, if I can divide you and keep you fighting amongst yourselves, I can effectively maintain what it is I have that I feel that you may have. Uh, I may, you know, they not want to put myself, but they may feel they have a right to those particular powers and advantages. But if they can keep you divided, keep us divided and we're fighting each other over race, over color of skin, we never have enough time to focus on eliminating the oppressive uh, structure that that's that's keeping us in that situation. We're looking at colors and again, blaming each other because of the color of skin and we're fighting because of the color of skin. And and uh, again, that keeps us completely unfocused, completely politically divided. The counter to that is to, you know, clean out your ears and open your eyes and see what's happening, whether you're black, white, brown or whatever. And understand that we all are are wanting and needing resources. I said before, good neighborhoods, good schools, et cetera, et cetera. Everyone wants that uh, for themselves and their family. But if I can convince you that you don't have it because of the person with a different skin color. Well, now your eyes are off the prize. Now you are fighting amongst yourselves and you never um, have enough uh, political sway or political power or influence to make the person oppressing you feel threatened enough to make a change. So don't be duped. Okay. I'm going to take uh, one more question and then take a quick break. Let's see. The next question comes from, uh, where is this from? Uh, this question is from the Czech Republic, the Czech Republic. Hans, is that Hans? All right. How do people in power benefit from people staying focused on race? Oh, OK, well, I, I think I, I was just addressing that in, uh, when I was addressing the previous question. How do people in power benefit by uh, people staying focused on race? Because it's, it's a distraction. Again, it's a distraction. It's, it's like the oldest trick of the book. Um, you know, while you're looking at my left hand, you know, I'm doing something else with my right hand. You know, your eyes are, are off the target and uh, those aren't your enemies. You can you can make enemies out of out of anybody. I mean, don't don't you you know, haven't you guys seen movies and read books where you, um, you know, maybe you read the art of war or know something about that divide and conquer? I mean, that's the one of the oldest adages that I'm aware of. Um Let's create enemies so that, you know, amongst yourselves, it, it's it's so simple. I, I just don't understand how people cannot reform their thinking and, and overcome these issues of racism. Now, I can dislike a person and I can dislike a person of an opposite race, but I don't dislike you just because you're an opposite race. Don't get me wrong. I'm not here with some kumbaya and you know, naive ideology and being idealistic and altruistic in, in, in this approach to say that people um, will always get along. But it, it doesn't have to be because of race. You know, there's some people within my own race that I don't trust and I don't necessarily like. And that would never be I don't want to say never, but it's unlikely that they would, you know, be it in my home or invited to my home and they're in my own race. It has nothing to do with race. There are some people of other races that would, you know, I definitely associate with and, and would be in my home and I'm happy to call them brothers and sisters and they're not in my race. So 
um, overcome yourselves, man. You know, renew your thinking. Renew your thinking because you, you'll perish. You'll, you'll perish. Believe me. All right. I'm going to take a quick break and then I'm going to come back and address some more of these questions and see where we go from here. You're listening to Let's Chew the Gum, the podcast where we talk about everything from A to Z. We'll be right back. Something for your mind. 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 Something for your mind. 